I've heard it said the oldest and strangest human emotion is fear. And the oldest and strongest fear is the fear of the unknown. Speaking from my time playing the Midnight Game, I can safely say this is true. None of us knew what had happened to Carlton, nor did we want to know. Just looking at his gaunt face was enough to send a chill down my spine. And the voices were still speaking in unison. One down, four left. One down, four left. One down, four left. They were chanting it over and over. I put my hand over my ears, trying to blot it out. And then my candle went out. I immediately tried to relight it, and I felt a hand touch my arm. I glanced up instantly to find myself looking into Josie's face. It was covered in panic as she pointed at the door. I only just struck the match when something moaned. It wasn't one of the voices. It was, it was human. The deep, guttural, feral groan of a man. The voices ceased chanting. Interesting, said the fifth voice. It would appear someone else is here, not a player of the midnight game. There are a few seconds of silence, a, a clink of glass from the door. Benny, Greg, Josie, and I all looked at it. An empty bottle was was rising slowly into the air, suspended by invisible hands that left pencil-thin markings in the dust. Run! It was a fifth voice. And then the bottle lurched up into the air before violently dropping onto the floor. It shattered, glass sparkling in the moonlight. A feral scream followed instantly. I barely remembered grabbing my candle and booking it out of there. Josie was the first to the door, and I trailed behind her. We both jointedly pushed the wheelchair out of the way, and it landed on its side with a loud crash as part of it cracked. The glass shards cracked under my shoes and that of my friends. Heavy footsteps were thundering down the hallway towards us, while a horrific screaming accompanied it. I struggled not to yell and scream in panic. Somehow, somehow none of my friends did either. Josie and Greg were sprinting down the hall in front of me, not daring to look back. I wanted to call out and beg them to wait up, but the heavy breathing next to my ear made me pause. I glanced over my shoulder to find Carlton's gaunt, pale face following me. His white hair contrasted against the darkness around us. A blank look was on his face, and his unlit candle was clasped in front of his chest. He pushed past me without a glance, slamming like against the wall as he seemed to glide down the hallway. My candle fell onto the ground, flame going out. I bent down to pick it up and relit it, then heard something else fall into the ground. Benny groaned in pain. I looked over and my heart dropped. Benny had tripped over and upended the wheelchair, dropping his candle, smoke drifting from the burnt lit wick. Benny's hands gritted against the broken glass as he lifted one up and reached for the black candle. Shards of glass were stuck in his palm, blood trailing down it. He grabbed the candle and Benny began to get to his feet. The thundering footsteps were almost on top of us. I was already rushing back to help Benny onto his feet when the candle suddenly lurched out of his hand, spinning across the ground. And then it stopped. It slowly lifted into the air when it when it flew into a curve through the air, Benny was already on his feet and caught it. Already trying to strike a match, it st I stared with wide eyes as the footsteps began to round the corner at the very end of the hallway. No, said one of the voices. No, he's not supposed to. Rules, said the fifth voice, are to be followed, not bent. But how can we win? Not by resorting to cheating, the fifth voice hissed back. Now players, do as I told you. Run! In the moonlight at the end of the hallway, a massive, towering figure lurched into view. Head, a bush of hair. The feral screams became the howl of an animal. I raced forward, grabbing Benny by the arm and began dragging him forward. He shook me off and then fell into step beside me, behind us. The howling was getting closer. The hallway split into three different directions at an intersection, not including the one we were already in. I glanced at Benny and pointed my finger to the right, then at him, still running. We were so close, Benny didn't need to be told twice what to do. The instant we reached the intersection, he took the right, and I turned to follow him. I slipped on a bottle, almost falling to the ground before I could steady myself. Benny paused, watching me with wide eyes, and turned, about to help me when I, I held up a free hand. The howling was almost on top of us. Without thinking, I began running in the opposite direction. I looked back to see Benny watching me go with a panicked expression before he ran to the other direction. Then his form was obscured by a lurking, hulking figure that howled at me. He chased me through the asylum, relentless in his pursuit. I don't know how I managed to evade him, ducking under broken doors that hung out from their frames limply. I, I swear I, I could feel his hot breath on the back of my neck. But he never managed to grab me. I knew that if his hands wrapped around my neck, I'd be done for. After I took another corner, then ducked into an abandoned room, his, his screams grew distant. 
I kept running, ignoring the way my lungs screamed in protest as I tried to find somewhere to hide. I stopped and I pushed through a set of double doors and found myself in what, what must have been a kitchen. Old pots and pans littered the floor along with knives that were covered with dark rust, spatulas, large serving spoons, and other cooking utensils that I couldn't name for the life of me. I began frantically looking around, trying to figure out where to hide. I opened one of the old fridges, then gagged at what I saw inside. It was the remains of a rat covered in fat, wriggling maggots. I slammed the door shut on instinct. There was a grunt from the distance just outside the double doors, and then... And then heavy footsteps. I scolded myself for having been so stupid. The heavy footsteps were getting closer, accompanied by grunting and deranged mumbles. I looked around. I, I ran to one of the cupboards, opened it, and shoved myself inside. The candle was my only illumination. As the footsteps got closer, I glanced down at the edge of the cupboard doors. Opened just a crack so I could breathe. Light from the candle was spilling out of it. Without thinking, I... I blew out my candle. And I hunched into the cupboard already digging into my pocket for the matches. Then the doors burst open and I froze. I could, I could hear the deep guttural voice of the crazy man speaking incoherently. The footsteps that plodded through the kitchen kicked aside anything in their path. A clatter of rust as something was broken apart. The slamming of a door. Discomfort crept into my body as I crouched inside the cupboard. My back arched. The footsteps continued to creep through the kitchen. Glass crunched close to me, and I cupped a hand over my mouth to stifle my gasps. Smoke drifted upward from my long, thin candle in my other hand. The footsteps came to stop directly in front of me, and a shadow was sitting in front of the cupboard door. The intelligible mumbling from directly in front of me it carried a, a distinct tone of menace to it. Unhinged, I should say. When something shuffled, the shadow moved, and then under the crack, I could see the bare, filthy feet of a man with yellow, fungus-infected toenails. And the other foot came into view, and both feet turned, coming to a stop directly in front of my cupboard. The mumbling was replaced by a long, deep sniff. And then something banged on the top of the cupboard. I bit my tongue so hard it began to bleed. Another bang above me, then several more poundings. The man was battering down, howling with rage. Tears began to roll down my face. I was... I was going to die here. And then the battering stopped. As did the howling. I listened closely as I heard a metallic squeak, followed by a door slamming shut. The feet with yellow claw-like toenails shuffled away. I waited until I heard them growing faint, the intelligible mumbling fading with them. I pulled up my matches, lit one, and held my candle steady as I put the flame back to the wick. I breathed a sigh of relief when a burning flame was now on top of it, and I, I blew out the match. Then slowly the cupboard door opened, coming to a stop when it was halfway from me. Dust on the inside of the door had been disturbed, leaving pencil-thin marks where the dust had been swept away. I waited with bated breath. The door shot forward and I winced. It didn't slam shut, however. It stopped just before it shut completely an inch from the cabinet. I jumped and I dropped my candle when my phone buzzed in my pocket. I instantly grabbed my candle before the flame could go out, holding it close to my face as I pulled up my phone. It was a text from Josie. My friends and I had set up a group chat for easy contact. I wasn't relieved to see Josie's message, however. What, what she had sent me made my blood run cold. Guys, I'm in the basement and I... I think I can hear something. I was the first to send a message back. Josie, get out of the basement, now. I watched as the three small dots appeared in a text box. Before her reply came through. I can't. There's something upstairs, blocking the door. I can hear one of the voices, whispering from the top. I think it's singing. I gulped and I saw another message, this time unmistakably from Benny. Josie, I'll try my best to help you. Greg, Larry, are, are you guys with Carlton? Greg answered first. I thought he was with one of you guys. My heart skipped to my chest and grimly sent another message. Guys, Carlton isn't with me. There wasn't any text boxes with small dots for a few seconds as that settled in. Just when I saw Benny begin to type, it happened. 
There was a sharp scraping sound like stones were being dragged along the metallic ground. The asylum began to shake and lurch. Not like an earthquake was happening beneath our feet. It was... This was different. It was... It was like the asylum was moving. A voice spoke right next to my ear. They're stirring. Then Josie sent another message. Guys, something's wrong down here. Something really wrong. I'm not alone. I'm scared. I can hear something screaming. I don't think it's human. Damn it, Benny. Why'd you convince us to play this game? Benny was just beginning to answer when the shaking stopped. Outside the cupboard, a dull green light was oozing into the crack. My phone buzzed and I checked the new message. It was Greg. Guys, he began. I'm looking out the window and... And I don't think we're on Earth anymore. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you for watching or listening to tonight's video or tonight's episode of the podcast. Please subscribe on YouTube if you'd like to get more videos from me, or subscribe on Spotify if you'd like to get more podcasts from uh, me. Or if you just like listening to me in general, you can always check out audible.com. On audible.com, I've got a bunch of different audiobooks that I've worked with for these authors that you may see across the channel. Some of my personal favorites I've worked on are the ones from Vincent Venacava, as well as the ones from Gas Station Jack or Jack Townsend. You can find all those audiobooks from Vincent, as well as Tales from the Gas Station, Volume 1 and Volume 2, available on audible.com. And now... For patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, which you can always find in the link in the description, I want to give you all a very big thanks. There's many of you down there in the descriptions um, who I give big thanks to, and everybody also at this tier, like Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chompinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, H.G. Weevil 3, Diana Krauss, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Nico Kao, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Don Mulemeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Sinner, Optimistic Avocado, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Polson, Finley, and Sky Harbor. You guys are the MVPs and you guys keep the channel running and I honestly cannot thank you enough for all that you do. That's all for tonight guys. Sweet dreams.